Welcome to MOOC course on introduction to proteogenomics. In the last two lectures, Dr. D. R. Mani provided you the basic information about how to now utilize your data generated to make it much more reliable and statistically amenable for further analysis. So, by now you are comfortable in generating data using mass spectrometers, but even you have obtained the very complex data sets for variety of samples, it becomes very crucial that you are really working on the right data set for analysis, you have done proper ways of normalization and now you need to employ the statistical tools for further analysis to find out the most significant hits out of a data. If your aim was to compare a disease versus a healthy individual and you have run you know hundreds of patient sample with the individual healthy uh, controls. Now your next goal is to find out how many proteins are differentially expressed which are significant from one to other population. In this slide, Dr. Mani's lecture today will focus on different types of statistical test and its applications in proteomics. So, as we all know that any data analysis requires the power of statistics to strengthen the outcome. Some of the important and very common type of test which are employed for this purpose includes correlation, regression and different comparison strategies. So, correlation is a technique which can show whether and how strongly the pairs of variables are related. Whereas, Pearson correlation is important to test for the strength of the association between two continuous variables. On other hand, the Spearman correlation is the test for the association between two ordinal variables, they does not rely on the assumption of normal distribution. Then next comes the regression which can estimate if a change in one variable can predict the change in other variables and there are mainly two types of regression test. A simple regression which test that how the changes in predictor variable can predict the level of change in the outcome variable. Whereas, the multiple regression looks for the test how change in the combination of multiple predictors variable can predict the level of change in the outcome variable. And the test which we often need in comparison of means which actually looks for the difference between the means of variable. Pair t test it is another important one where it tests for the difference between two related variables. Independent t test on the other hand looks for the differences between two independent variables. Next comes the ANOVA or the analysis of variance. This analyzes the difference among group means in a sample, but sometimes when data does not meet assumptions required for the parametric test, we have to then do non parametric test which means the data is not required to fit a normal distribution. A simple test Wilcoxon sign rank, this test used to compare two related samples to assess whether their population mean ranks differ or not. Two sample test Wilcoxon man Whitney test, this test is used to compare the outcomes between two independent groups whose data are not normally distributed. So, I am sure you appreciate that there are variety of statistical tests and options available to compare your data. Under which context you need to employ which type of test becomes very crucial to understand and that is where today's Dr. Mani's lecture is going to give you more detail and examples that in which context you need to employ which type of statistical test for your data analysis. Let us welcome Dr. D. R. Mani for his today's lecture. This is a kind of a, a, a cartoon figure for how a t-test works. So, you have some mean and you have some distribution about the mean. So, based on the distribution about the mean you calculate a standard deviation and based on that you calculate a t statistic 
and if that statistic is extreme enough you say then it is statistically significant. So, you use the extremeness of the statistic to calculate your p value and so the p value and the uh, extreme value of the statistic are correlated. So, if you have a low p value then your statistic is more extreme than usual and so based on that you can. Uh, so, if mu was very different from 0 and if this distribution was not too big then you would say this is statistically not 0. But if this was close to 0 or your dis variation was so large that you could not tell whether it was 0 or not then you would not say it is statistically significant intuitively. Similarly, for a two sample t test you are looking at two groups and you want to see if the difference in means is large enough. So, it, not, it depends not only on the difference of the means, but also on how much variation you have around each mean. So, that is why you do not want to like just take the means and then see if they are different. You want to do a formal test to take the variation of those measurements around uh, the mean into account. Did someone have a question? So, um, a regular t test usually ends up being very unreliable uh, when you do it with a small number of samples like 5, 10. Uh, if you have that many samples, then a regular t test when you calculate the standard deviation depending on the actual samples you have measured, the standard deviation can vary quite a bit. And when that happens, the t statistic varies quite a bit. And so, your p values can vary quite a bit and will not be robust when you do a uh, test with a small number of samples. So, there is a variant called a moderated t test. So, what we do here is we look at all the data we have seen, we look at all the proteins we have measured and see what is the average variation for the proteins. And then you pick a specific protein and if that protein is varying way too much, you say this lo does not look like all the proteins I have seen in terms of variation. So, I am going to damp down the variation uh, based on what I have seen in all my data. So, you kind of moderate your uh, standard deviation calculations to make your test more robust. So, when you are working with small numbers of samples, it is a very good idea to apply a moderated test. When you have large numbers like 50 or 100, a moderated test and a regular t test would probably give you the same results. But if you have smaller number of samples, a moderated test is usually uh, much more robust. So, the f test like I mentioned is for multiple groups. So, you want to see whether any of these means are different from 0. <coughs> so, um, there are a lot of non parametric tests which I am going to skip for uh, reasons of time, uh, but the whatever you can do with a parametric test you can also do with a non parametric test. So, uh, there are many. So, the t test whatever it does, it checks whether two means are the same or not. So, there is a um, the, the rank test that can do the same uh, similarly for a two sample test and for an f test and so forth. So, I would not go into the non parametric tests, but I they are listed in the slides and you guys can take a look. Sir, uh, you about the one sample yeah. Yes. Yes. Only one group. And you are checking whether the value of the mean is same as 0 or not. So, that is where so, um, the kind of data you have is very important. So, let us say you have ratios that come out of your uh, mass spec processing software and you did not log transform it and you do a one sample t test. You are always going to get things as everything will be significant because 0 is not even a valid value you are ever going to get out of the um, the software you are doing. If you just take ratios, the value is going to be greater than 0 all the way to infinity. And when you do a statistical test to see whether it is more than 0 or not, it is going to be more than 0 by definition. So, that date for a data that is only a ratio, you would not do a one sample t test because it does not make sense conceptually. But once you log transform it, then the question you are asking is whether it is up or down regulated because if it is up regulated it is greater than 0, whether it is if it is down regulated it is less than 0 and if it is not regulated it is around 0. So, that is the reason why we kind of do a log transform because it makes things symmetric and uh, may, makes many of these tests applicable. So, if you took only a ratio you cannot apply a one sample t test, but if you took the log of the ratio then you can. <coughs> 
that is true. I am assuming you will have some. So, Carl is mentioning uh, that I should point out that to do any test you need replicates because why do you think you need replicates? What are we calculating? Variance. Variance exactly we are calculating standard deviation and you cannot calculate standard deviation with a single number you need at least 2. So, in to do any of these statistical tests you have to have replicates without replicates you cannot do uh, either a one sample or a two sample or any of the tests. So, if you measured your sample only once or there is a group for which you have only one sample. So, you are doing breast cancer analysis and your uh, HER2 positive group you have only one sample and you cannot say anything about that group because you do not have enough replicates to do a formal test. So, any number you see you can not tell whether it was 0 or not. So, in the worst case if all you have is one sample and you desperately want to say something about it what you can do is you can um, plot the log ratios and then pick the most extreme value you assume it is a normal distribution and in a normal distribution anything that is beyond 2 or 3 standard deviations is considered uh, an outlier or not is a is an extreme value. So, you can do something like that and still come up with a list of proteins or genes that are different if you have only one replicate, but that should really be a, an extreme situation that you hopefully never run into, uh, but it happens sometimes. Uh, so, in for all these tests you need replicates and the more you have the more uh, robust your results will be. Uh, if you are doing cell line based work and uh, studying the effect of a certain drug on cell line. Yeah. So, we have one control and one uh, drug treated sample yeah. and the sample size is also very less I mean one two groups are there. So, in this scenario what, what should be done? So, the question was uh, they they have a drug treatment experiment where the treated and untreated are a like few samples like very small number of samples and they want to find what is that what is different. So, you would do a moderated test uh, assuming you have at least 2 for both treated and untreated and you would do a moderated uh, t test. So, moderated tests work well with small numbers of samples 2 is probably cutting it close, but if that is what you have that is what you have. So, in our group there are a lot of studies where we have only two replicates and we we work we have done moderated tests with those. There are a lot of other tricks you can use when you are working with just two replicates. You can try to remove things that are not reproducibly measured in both the replicates. Uh, you can um, you can kind of try to uh, trim your data to do as little uh, as few tests as possible. Uh, but you can still uh, do a moderated test. Can the sample in number of the various sizes can be compared in a single group? What do you mean? Like her 2, 3, then other type 5 or 7. So, different number of samples per group? Per group. Yeah, so that is one of the beauty of the uh, test is that you put all the samples of a group together and calculate mean and variance. So, if you had a group with 50 samples the mean and variance calculation will be very robust you will be fine. If you have a group with only 2 samples the mean and robust uh, variance can still be calculated, but it would not be as robust. So, if you compare a group 2 groups where you had larger number of samples uh, and the marker was different you will get a lower p value, but if one of the groups has fewer samples you can still do the comparison, but your p value will be higher because the the uh, the uh, 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 the way the 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 how de definite you are about the estimation of your parameters is more uncertain with fewer samples. So you can do it, but you'll get uh, correspondingly higher p values. So, so you said that extreme values are actually outliers, but extreme values. But yeah. uh, could there be situations where these extreme values are actually true and should not be considered as outliers and? Because, uh, well, uh, uh, outlier was probably not the right word to use I think. So, when you have a distribution of things, things that are at the extremes are considered to be uh, unlikely in most situations. So, that is why they are considered to be uh, 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 to validate the alternate hypothesis. Uh, 
So um, in that way, they are outliers, but they are still part of the distribution. So if you have only one measurement, it's quite possible that something that was an outlier, if you measured it again, would be in the middle, because it was a very low abundant protein, and you can't measure it well, and you ended up measuring it having one poor measurement. So that's the problem with using only one sample for analysis. And that's the reason why you want more samples. So if you have two replicates, and one was an extreme, the other was right in the middle, then the statistical test is going to say, wait, it was over there and this is here. That means I can't really conclude that this is an extreme value or a central value. So I'm going to say this is not different based on the variance. But if both measurements came out in the outlier, then you have more evidence that this is actually an extreme value. And so it would be statistically significant. So that's where the variation of your values is taken into account in calculating your statistical significance. If you have only one replicate, too bad. You can't do it. That's what I'm saying. The model I'm saying is a normal distribution. Yeah, you could assume other distributions by looking at it. But again, you have to fit a distribution to an observed set of values and then use that distribution to calculate which ones are extreme. Right, but for the, uh, for the genomics, what kind of models may work? So most likely people use normal. Um, sometimes they use a log normal distribution, which is um, basically if you had direct ratios, you could use a log normal or a chi-square distribution. Um, and I think he mentioned a Pareto distribution. So if you have sort of normally distributed but with very heavy tails, you can use a Pareto distribution. The problem is the more uh, complex or exotic the distribution becomes, the more things you have to estimate in order to fit the distribution. So for a normal distribution, you just need mean and standard deviation. And the more parameters you have to estimate, the more uncertain your fitting becomes, and so the more um, uh, kind of questionable your results become. Okay. Yeah. So replicates, are we talking about technical or biological? Uh, when I mentioned replicates, I meant biological replicates. If you have technical replicates, then technical replicates are correlated because it's the same thing you are running again and again. So suppose you had a study where you had five biological samples and you ran three replicates of each, you can't put the 15 together and do a t-test because the t-test assumes that your samples are independent. Here they are not because three of them came from the same biological sample. So there you, ha you have to do what is called correlated uh, analysis. You have to uh, account for the correlation. So there are a couple of uh, uh, models you can use for that. They are more complicated and I won't go into it today. But I, the lima package I mentioned earlier, you can specify that these three are technical replicates of that sample. And then you can take that into account in, in your modeling. So it all boils down to you have to calculate variance. And the question is, is the variance the same for all the samples? Or our groups of samples have different variances? So there is a variance matrix you calculate. And the structure of the variance matrix is what decides how you deal with replicates and technical replicates and biological replicates. And so when you have technical replicates, you have to specify that to calculate the appropriate structure for the variance matrix. So there are models called linear mixed effect models that are very versatile. They can account for um, things like correlation because of replication. They can account for time series. Uh, they can even take missing values into account, and they provide some kind of moderation of how you calculate variances and things like that. But they are harder to set up, and many times they don't converge, and you have to like fiddle with the models to make sure it works. And it's not straightforward for a uh, for a person who hasn't worked with them to just like use it easily, which is why I don't want to cover it now. So this is one thing that I want to mention, and after that I. I think I should be done. <clears throat> so we have mentioned that we are going to do a statistical uh, test to figure out whether a marker is uh, different in cancers versus controls, let's say. So you, you just measured 10,000 proteins. So you want to find whether each protein is a marker or not. So you do the test 10,000 times. And you say anything that has a p-value of less than 0 0.05 
is a marker, is statistically significant and is a marker. So when you repeatedly apply the same test a large number of times, just by sheer chance, you will get things that are, that pass the test. So you have a 5% chance that something that was not a marker will have a p-value less than 0.05. So an alpha of 0.05 means that your false positive rate or false positive probability is 5%. So just by sheer chance, by repeatedly doing the test on different markers, some number of them are going to be marked as false positive even though, or, or marked as a marker even though they are not. This actually gets significantly worse if you look at the example here. So an example I have here is you want to decide whether a coin is fair or not. So you flip the coin 10 times, did you say 10? Yeah. So you flip the coin 10 times and if you get 9 heads, the probability of that happening is 0 0.01 if you do the calculations using the binomial theorem. So this is definitely less than uh, 0.05. So if you get 9 heads, then you can conclude that your coin is biased. It is giving more heads than tails. So if that is your, how you set up your hypothesis test and you test 100 coins, there is a 65% chance that you will find at least one coin that is biased even though all your coins are fine. So if you repeat the test many, many times, you, you will very likely find things that are different just by random chance. To avoid that, what we do is when we do a lot of tests like in genomics and proteomics, we do this thing called multiple testing correction. We want to correct for the fact that um, our p-values do not quite represent the real false positive rate. So there are a lot of ways to correct for um, uh, the multiple testing. I will just mention two. So one is called the Bonferroni correction. This is the most conservative correction. If you do this correction and your marker still is significant at 0 0.05, then no reviewer will come back and question you. Uh, what you do here is, suppose you did 100 tests, then you take your p-value that you get and multiply it by 100. So this is assuming that each of your tests are independent and um, you uh, basically correct by multiplying your p-value by the number of tests that you do. So, um, so you can see that if you have an uh, uh, unadjusted p-value of 0 0.05 and you do 100 tests, then multiplying by 100 is going to make the p-value basically uh, go beyond 1, which means it's, it is it, not significant. So this is the most stringent correction and many times this is too conservative, especially with noisy data in genomics and proteomics. If you apply this test, you will basically never ever get any markers that are significant. But the, the reason that happens, it happens is because this assumes that all your tests are independent, that they are not related to each other. But we know that genes and proteins have relations. So if you are, they are part of the same pathway, they kind of behave similarly and that there are a lot of uh, correlations and relations between genes and pathways that you have measured. And so this in fact does not quite hold. So why do you want to be so conservative when you know that your uh, testing was not exactly like the assumptions that are made here. So a more uh, relaxed correction is called the Benjamin E. Hochberg F correction. Here what you do is you define this thing, um, a, a correction factor. Um, that you apply to all your p-values. So intuitively what you do is you sort your p-values from smallest to largest. For the smallest one, the lowest p-value you got, you do the Bonferroni correction. So if you did 100 tests, the lowest p-value you multiply by 100. The next one you multiply by 99. The third one you multiply by 98. So you keep relaxing the, the stringency which, which you correct as you go down the uh, sorted list of p-values. So intuitively that is what happens and the paper, this is actually almost universally used nowadays and the paper shows that if you did that and you set a p-value threshold of 0.05, then your false discovery rate, in other words how many things that are false in your entire list when you draw the cutoff there is uh, 5% or whatever value you pick. And so this is a reasonable one to use. <coughs> 
And many times in small experiments where he mentioned you have a, a, a drug response experiment of two versus two, uh, even the FDA Benjamin E. Hockberg correction may result in p-values that are, I don't know, 0.1 or 0.2. And in those cases, we just use the p-value as a ranking mechanism. In conclusion, we have now learnt how to choose a right type of a statistical test and how to correct test can give the significant outcome from your data set. We also learnt increasing the number of samples provides you much more increased confidence and the statistical power to your data. We will continue more interaction with Dr. Mani and in the next lecture he will talk to you about machine learning and clustering. Thank you.